Moving into my new home gave me a good excuse to upgrade some of my tech, and one of the things I've been looking to do for a long time was to build my own home server. In my old house, I ran most of my smart home on an Intel NUC PC. This was running Home Assistant, Frigate, Zigbee to MQTT, and a whole bunch of other stuff inside Docker containers. Every now and then, usually when my CCTV cameras detected motion, the Intel NUC would max out its CPU as Frigate started doing a bunch of image processing. On top of that, I've also got a desktop PC with four big hard disks inside set up in a RAID array. This is where I store all my media files, my YouTube filming, and any important documents that I didn't want to lose if one of the drives failed. It was running Plex, acting as my file server, and meant that I generally would leave it running 24 by 7. I also use the PC for gaming, so it has a power-hungry graphics card in it and a 550 watt power supply. In this video, you'll see how I plan to consolidate all of these use cases onto a new, powerful, but more energy efficient computer that lives inside my shiny new comms rack in the laundry. Let's take a look. Before we get started, I know that having a comms rack in the laundry is dumb. Unfortunately, that's where whoever built the house ran all of the network and audio cabling to. It's also one of the few places that I actually have room for a rack, and the only place that I can put it that won't annoy my partner. I also know that my cable management could be considerably improved. But it works fine, there's no reason to change it at the moment, especially since I'm still plugging and unplugging things as I get my house set up. Keep leaving me comments about it if you want, but at the end of the day, I really just don't give a shit. Like everything else I've been doing with my smart home, I first wrote down all the requirements that I had for my home server before I spent any money. Obviously, I wanted it to fit into my rack, so I jumped onto a website called servercases.co.uk and took a look at their offerings. I wanted one that took up no more than two rack units of space. Comms racks and the equipment that fits into them usually measure heights in rack units. This makes it easier to plan a comms rack and make sure that everything lines up nicely. Patch panels and network switches are usually one unit in height, and my server would be twice as high as one of those, leaving plenty of space in my rack, which is 15 rack units high. You can get one unit server cases, but they're a pain in the ass to work in, and you usually need to get special server components to fit nicely inside them. Special server components are ludicrously expensive and are totally over the top for home use, even for me. I wanted to run a standard desktop PC motherboard, CPU, and all the other components. I also wanted to have space for two fat hard disks in there that were mirrored, so I wouldn't need to keep a separate file server or a NAS. I chose a server case that met these requirements, and ordered the rail mounting kit and the power supply at the same time. They were all in stock when I ordered mine. And it's a good idea to order all the things at the same time from the same website because you'll know that they're designed to work together. Now that I had my server case chosen, it was time to buy all the bits I needed to go inside it. I wanted to go with an Intel CPU because they've got a thing called Intel Quick Sync which helps with video processing. This would be useful for my CCTV camera processing and for transcoding files on my media server. That means I don't need to buy a separate graphics card. I ended up choosing the Intel i5 CPU because it was a good balance between price, performance, and power consumption. I then picked a compatible motherboard that I thought would fit into the server case I'd bought and made sure that it had two NVMe slots for solid state hard drives, enough memory slots so that I could jam 32 gigabytes of RAM into it, and SATA ports for my fat hard drives. I'm not going to put together a parts list of everything that I bought, because when it comes to computers, things move so quickly that it will probably be out of date the minute this video goes online. The key takeaways you need to know if you're going to build your own home server are 1. Get a server case first that meets your requirements, and then order all the components that will physically fit inside later on. 2. Make sure that your motherboard is compatible with your RAM and your CPU. Computer stores often sell bundles with a CPU, RAM, and motherboard all pre-installed together, so you know they're going to work. Three, computer equipment, especially hard drives, often go up incrementally in cost for more speed, storage, or power until it hits a certain point and then shoots up dramatically. Take a look at the options you have available in your budget and see if it's worth stretching maybe $50 or $100 more where it makes sense to get better bang for your buck. Eventually all my parts arrived, and I started putting it all together. It honestly felt a bit like Christmas. I've been building PCs since I was a teenager, and those used to be cobbled together from old parts that neighbours or family members were getting rid of. Getting brand new shiny computer parts delivered to build a new PC has always gotten me a little bit excited. Like I said, massive nerd. Eventually my motherboard was all assembled and it was time to put it into the server case. 
Remember when I said I was more of a measure once and cut twice kind of guy? Yeah, I bought the wrong size motherboard for my server case because I didn't read the specs properly. Don't be like me. So I bought another motherboard and listed the old one for sale on eBay like an idiot and put the rest of the server together. It all turned out to fit quite nicely in the end and again, I think the cable management is perfectly fine. Another requirement I had for the server was for it to flexibly run all sorts of different applications on it, from Home Assistant for my home automation, Piehole for blocking ads and tracking cookies on my home network, Frigate for my CCTV object detection, a file server, and anything else that I might think of in the future. In my last smart home, I used Docker to run all of these different applications inside containers. It was awesome, and it taught me a lot about Docker and containers in general. I never had any problems with it, it was really flexible, and every application that I wanted to run worked great inside a Docker container. If you're interested in how you can use Docker to run smart home applications, then you should check out the playlist that I've got with all of my Docker related videos in it. I've put a link to it in the description below. So many of you commented on those Docker videos asking me why I didn't look into running a virtualization environment like Proxmox. My good mate Ed is always banging on about how good Proxmox is as well. Virtualization is essentially a way of running many different computers inside one computer. A program called a hypervisor runs on your main computer's operating system and it carves out little chunks of your hard disk, CPU and memory and gives it up to a virtual computer. You can then run a new operating system and any application inside this virtual machine and it keeps it all separate. The advantage of this is that I can add new applications to my server at any time really easily by putting them in their own virtual machine. This means I won't break any of the other applications that I have and if I later decide that I want to remove that app, I can just delete the virtual machine. I can install any operating system that I want into my virtual machine, which means I can run Windows on top of a hypervisor that runs on Linux, which is pretty cool and gives me heaps of flexibility. Docker containers work in a similar way to virtual machines, but are more lightweight because they share parts of the operating system with the underlying host. Proxmox sounded cool because it lets you create both virtual machines and containers, so you get the best of both worlds. I watched a bunch of videos about Proxmox online and decided it would be great to run on my new server. I've used hypervisors like VMware or Amazon EC2 in past jobs, so I was familiar with the concepts of virtualization, but I've never personally run my own virtualization environment. Installing Proxmox sounded like something cool and new to learn, and I really like learning new things. It was surprisingly easy to get up and running. Just go to the Proxmox website and download the latest version of Proxmox VE. You can then use our trusty old mate Belina Etcher to flash the ISO image to a USB flash drive, just like we've done in previous videos. Then you plug the USB drive into the server and boot up from it. If all went well, you should see the Proxmox setup wizard and you just select install Proxmox VA. Read and accept the license agreement. Now choose the hard disk that you want to install Proxmox onto. I've got four hard disks installed into my server. I have two solid state drives that are one terabyte each and my two fat hard disks that are eight terabytes each. I want to install my hypervisor operating system, Proxmox, onto one of the two one terabyte solid state drives because they're really fast. I'll explain what the other hard disks are for later on. Fill out your location information, set a password, and now give the computer a name and an IP address. You'll want to set a static IP address here so that it always stays the same. Then it will show you all the options you put in and you can click install. After a few minutes, it'll be done installing and you can remove the USB disk and it'll boot up into Proxmox. It was actually a heck of a lot easier than I was expecting. You can now go to another computer, fire up a web browser, and navigate to the IP address of the Proxmox server with the port 8006. When you're asked to log in, use the username root and the password you set during the installation process. I had no idea what I was doing from this point forward, but it sure was exciting. After a bit of research, I came across a GitHub library of Proxmox helper scripts, which looked really useful. It's a collection of scripts that can be used to install all sorts of applications into Proxmox, including Home Assistant. I'm going to be using this resource a lot, and I've linked to it in the description below if you want to use it too. The first one that I noticed was the Proxmox post install script, which sets a bunch of settings and enables a few things that are useful. I'm normally pretty against copying random things off the internet and running them on my computer, 
but a lot of people were mentioning it in forums, on YouTube, and on Reddit, so it seemed kind of peer-reviewed. To run the scripts, you need to SSH into your Proxmox server using PuTTY or some other SSH client. You can then copy the script command from the tools library for anything that you want to run and paste it into your SSH window. It will then run that script. Once I had the post install script out of the way, I wanted to configure the rest of my hard disks before I fired up any virtual machines. My first hard disk was already configured by the Proxmox installer. It's the one that the Proxmox hypervisor and the operating system are currently running on. This is a one terabyte fast solid state hard disk and that will be reserved to just run Proxmox. The second hard disk is a similar one terabyte fast solid state hard disk and that's where my virtual machines are going to be living on. The hypervisor will chop up little parts of this hard disk and give a small chunk of it to each of the virtual machines that I create. You could just as easily store the virtual machines on the same hard disk that Proxmox is running on, but I've heard horror stories on the internet where one of the virtual machines starts eating up all of the hard disk space, which means that Proxmox runs out of space and no longer boots up. That's not something I want to happen to me, so I'm giving the virtual machines their own hard disk. Finally, I've got two 8 terabyte old school spinny magnet hard disks which I'm going to mirror and put all of my home automation guy footage, my Proxmox backups and other wares on. Mirroring them means that data is written to both disks at the same time, so there's a copy of every file on both of the disks. If one of these hard disks fails, there's a copy of everything on the other disk, so I won't lose two years worth of YouTube footage that I've recorded or the backups of my virtual machine. I also back this data up to my desktop PC and a USB hard drive in case my washing machine explodes and floods my server rack. If we go into Proxmox, we can see all of these disks listed out. The NVMe drives are my solid state one terabyte disks, and the SDA and SDB disks are my two fat drives. We'll start by mirroring these two eight terabyte drives using ZFS, which is some sort of Unix file system that all the Proxmox nerds rave about. I couldn't figure out how to do this in Proxmox in a way that also lets me use the disks for other things, so we'll do it in the terminal using the zpool command. You can see the output from the lsblk command matches what we saw in the Proxmox disks area, and we'll use the zpool command to create a mirror called data out of the SDA and SDB disks. If we run lsblk again, we see that there are some partitions now on those disks, and the zfs list command shows us that it's also created a mount point called slash data, which we can cd into. I'm going to create a few directories in here for Proxmox backups, templates, ISO images, and some places to store my media and shared files. Next up, we're going to use the Proxmox user interface to configure the other one terabyte hard disk to store our virtual machines on. This again uses zfs, and we'll create a single disk storage pool that uses the whole one terabyte disk. Finally, we'll go to the data center storage area and tell Proxmox which disks to use for which things. Here you can add a new storage option. I'm going to choose directory and put in the path to the directories I created on my fat hard disk ZFS pool and tell Proxmox what to use each of them for. I'll do this for my templates, ISO images, and backups. I also did this for the VM data ZFS pool I created from my one terabyte disk and told it to keep disk images and containers there. I wanted to delete all of the local options which pointed to my original one terabyte disk which was reserved for Proxmox so that I didn't accidentally create virtual machines or containers on there, but I couldn't figure out how to do that and ended up just disabling them instead. The only thing left to do now was put it into my rack, plug in my USB Zigbee coordinator and install Home Assistant on it. I once again SSH into the Proxmox server and used the script from the GitHub library to install Home Assistant. I chose advanced mode because I'm hardcore. I want to install the stable version, but you could use this to run both the stable version on one virtual machine and then the beta version on another virtual machine. Then there were a bunch more questions about types and other things, all of which meant absolutely fucking nothing to me and I instantly regretted choosing the advanced method. But finally it created the new virtual machine, downloaded the image for it and was done. Back in the Proxmox user interface, I clicked on the new Home Assistant virtual machine and went to the summary screen. Here I found its IP address, which I copied and pasted into a new browser window with the 8123 port at the end, and voila! We have the Home Assistant operating system running inside a virtual machine on my new server. This is the full operating system version of Home Assistant, not the container version, which means I get access to add-ons and everything else that you get from a Home Assistant Yellow or a Raspberry Pi. The only thing you don't get is a built-in Zigbee radio, but I've plugged in my trusty Home Assistant Sky Connect into my server, and now I just need to map the USB device from my server through to the Home Assistant virtual machine. 
This is done in the hardware section of the virtual machine, and we want to map through our USB device. Choose the Sky Connect or whatever USB coordinator you're using from the list, and it will then be available inside the Home Assistant virtual machine. And then you can install the Zigbee Home Automation integration just like normal. You can use the same method to map through any USB dongle like Bluetooth or a Google Coral TPU, whatever you want available in your virtual machine. And if you decide you no longer want a virtual machine for some reason, you can easily just remove it using the Proxmox user interface and boof, it's gone. And that's how I went about building and setting up my new home server. I'm an absolute beginner when it comes to Proxmox, so there may be a ton of things that you've just seen that I've done totally wrong. If you think that there's something that I should change or do differently, then let me know in the comments below. I'm going to be installing other applications onto Proxmox later on, and if there's anything in particular you want to see me set up, then please also let me know in the comments. But now my home network is installed, I've got my server up and running, and Home Assistant is installed on it with a Zigbee USB coordinator ready to go. All the foundations are now in place, and it's time to start making this new home smart. I'm going to start by automating the lights, because it's been an absolute ball ache having to use switches on the walls with my hands to turn on and off the lights like some sort of caveman. This house came with lots and lots of recessed GU10 ceiling lights in it, and replacing all of these with smart bulbs would be ridiculously expensive and super annoying. I've decided instead to replace the wall switches with smart ones, which is a lot cheaper. In the lead up to moving into the house, I bought what felt like hundreds of different smart switches and relays, and tested them out in this test rig that my dad and I made. I wanted to find the perfect smart home light switch, which turned out to be really difficult because most of them are absolute garbage. In the next video, I'm going to show you all the different lights I tested, what I liked about them, what I didn't like about them, and which ones I ended up with and how I connected them into my smart home. If that's the kind of thing that you want to see, then make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that together we can make your home smarter.